All right, welcome everybody to Finding Truth. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the Great Apostasy. And for those of you guys who don't know what that is, we're going to go ahead and explain that to you. Uh, and with me, I have Eric, who uh, has been in the show a couple of times already, and a new guy. Uh, his name is Aaron. And so we're just going to go ahead and basically let Eric introduce himself uh, and then uh, Aaron and just let us uh, know a little bit about your background, some of the things you have been doing, ministry or anything like that. Cool. Thanks, Santi. Hey, once again, I love being on your channel and with Explain International. Um, I'm actually an apprentice now with Explain International, um, doing ministry with them. Um, and I just love all my brothers and sisters in that ministry. Um, so I was raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, came out when I was about 18 years old and uh, was an agnostic for a while. Um, came to faith in Christ. Um, when I was in 2013 and from there started going, uh, I got a bachelor's degree and now I'm close to getting my MDev degree. And then I'll be pursuing a PhD afterwards uh, in systematic theology. Um, Lord willing, obviously. Um, but yeah, so that's just a quick little snippet about me. Um, I'll let Aaron take most of the time since a lot of the guests probably already know me. My name is Aaron Shafa Wallaf. I am a research associate with Mormonism Research Ministry. I moved out in Utah to Utah in 2005, and I was there almost 15 years doing street evangelism once a week, three seasons a year, uh, mostly at Temple Square, talking to Latter-day Saints and whoever else would talk to us, sharing the, we shared the gospel. Um, it was a part of some church plants in Utah. Today, I'm a student in Kansas City at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary with the intent of sharpening my sword and going back to Utah, being a part of more evangelism and church planning. But uh, there's more to the story, but the the, the short of it is I, I love the gospel. I love the Bible and I love the people of Utah and the Latter-day Saint people. And uh, I just love sharing the gospel with them. And I love seeing them come to faith and be discipled and put in local churches and fall in love with the God of the Bible and the, and the gospel of grace. All right. So uh, since I guess one of the first things that I said was that if people didn't know what the great apostasy is, uh, would you mind, uh, Aaron, explain, uh, explaining what the great apostasy is, uh, sort of like the maybe the historical view, and if it has changed, perhaps like, you know, dwell into that a little bit. Eric, you can uh, give your thoughts after Aaron uh, is done. Yeah, so in early Mormonism, there was a sense that there had been a loss of charismata, of the vibrant practice of spiritual gifts like prophecy and tongues. And there was, I'd say, an inheritance of a contemporary evangelical Protestant idea that there had been a general apostasy with uh, rebellion and wickedness. Uh, and uh, the Book of Mormon itself teaches, published in 1830, that there was formed a great and abominable church that opposed the people of God, that plain and precious things had been taken out of scripture. Uh, but again, this, this early idea was a more general uh, idea of apostasy. Uh, it grew uh, to include something called priesthood authority. So uh, a couple years after the publishing of the Book of Mormon, there was developed an idea that there had been a ritual priesthood authority lost from the church and that needed restoration into the church. Where, when the LDS church started, there was just no clear idea that this was even a thing. So this idea of apostasy and the early church, it really grew to include uh, the idea of ritual priesthood authority, this idea that there has to be bequeathed or ritually ordained uh, upon a, a male believer, something that has continuity with Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood from the Old Testament. So this further grew when Joseph Smith in Nauvoo uh, developed his doctrine of God. This is where you've got more clear polytheism. Uh, you've got the idea that God himself is uh, constitutionally material. He's fundamentally a God of parts. And he, Joseph Smith even goes on to 
say that we could become gods and God himself was once a man who had to become a God. So uh, as the Latter-day Saint doctrine of God grew, it's sense of apostasy grew and it's, it's narrative about these early and really important doctrines and even ordinances of eternal marriage and exaltation. These things had once supposedly been a part of the earliest scriptures or the earliest teachings of the apostles, but they had been plain and precious truths taken out of the early teachings, the early scriptures. Um, so th there's, there, you, there is what you might call a thick and a thin or a maximal and a minimal definition to great apostasy. Uh, if you really expand it outward, you'll get something uh, like I've described here, but uh, among more informed Mormons, you'll sometimes get a, a kind of narrowing down of the concept to merely that of the earliest believers uh, due to unfortunate circumstances, uh, but with the best of intentions, were unable to pass down that ritual priesthood authority. I, I really should say, though, just to, just to summarize, uh, the, the key of the idea of the great apostasy is that the kingdom of God and the church were completely obliterated on, on earth. They were completely removed from earth, absent from earth, uh, no longer being perpetuated, completely dead, uh, just gone. Uh, so that, that'll be really important as we revisit this discussion. Okay. Eric, do you have any? Yeah, I guess I'll come to it from just my personal experience as a Latter-day Saint. Now, I'm not going to say that every Latter-day Saint was taught this uh, because it, it varies throughout, even through the scholarship um, of when this took place or what took place. But just as a Latter-day Saint, I was taught that um, basically the priesthood and ordinances were just taken out after the apostles um, and men just manipulated the texts and we don't have any... We didn't have anything until Joseph Smith came around. Um, so basically all, all of the church that Jesus and the apostles built was just gone. And it wasn't until Joseph Smith came along and uh, restored the gospel. And that's exactly what he even says, that he's, he's restoring the church of Jesus. All right. Um, and that's exactly, I guess, what they need um, that's the importance of the faith is the restoration of the gospel. Okay, so um, I guess uh, to a more contemporary time, do you guys do you guys think that uh, most uh, LDS people will agree with uh, the definitions that you guys gave just a little bit ago, or do you think that um, I know that you said that it, it all depends, but um, the reason why I'm asking that is because I want to I want I guess I want to make sure that if they're there is a little bit of different angles that perhaps um, we can cover this. I don't know if you guys want to uh, say the safest more. minimal definition is is the safest where you've got a loss of priesthood authority. Uh, that's pretty common among Latter Day Saint beliefs. In right. the eighteen thirty eight yeah. edition of, or was that directed toward Eric? Sorry about that. Either one. No, 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 no. I I just forgot to mute my live mic. My bad. <laughs> In the eighteen thirty eight. Uh, version of the first vision, Joseph Smith is told that all the creeds of others are, of other churches are an abomination. Um, their professors are corrupt. Their churches are wrong. That stark language had such a, a, a central role to play in the Latter-day Saint presentation throughout the years. But today it does seem like Latter-day Saints are very shy about the expressing, exp expressing of the strength of the historic great apostasy doctrine. So what I'm representing to you here is really coming from Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles with a little bit of sort of cultural understanding around it. Uh, just, Mormonism is kind of hard to nail down. Sometimes you've got a historic stream, you've got an academic stream, you've got a cultural stream. Um, right. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, uh, what is it? It's like jello, like nailing jello to the wall. <laughs> Yeah. So, and then also, Aaron, ju just to add from uh, from like a Latter Day Saint perspective, is you're right. You know, that's just the basics there. But um, yeah, w we got to remember that in the first vision, who said that everything was an abomination? Apparently, Jesus said that. So Joseph Smith is claiming that this is happening and putting Jesus' name on it to give it power 
at what's going on. And if we look at just the historical background of what's going on there is he, he claims that there was a, a, a revival in the area and all these denominations are. So a lot of lay Latter-day Saints, um, including myself when I was, was the question of all these denominations. They can't all be true. You know, and we still kind of see that in, in Christianity, too, where denominations just share different interpretations of the text. But we all have a commonality on who Jesus is um, and what the gospel is. And that's where Mormonism shies away from. Okay. Um, I guess uh, I'm going to start with, with you, Eric, on this one. And then, uh, Aaron, you can uh, uh, give your thoughts after that. So why is the great apostasy necessary from an LDS perspective? Right. So the great apostasy is the foundation of the Latter-day Saint Church. A lot of them will disagree on this and they'll say, no, our foundation is in the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith. Well, guess what? That is all squashed. It never happened if there's no great apostasy. If there's no great apostasy, then there's no need for a restoration. So just like the resurrection is the foundation of Christianity, the great apostasy is the foundation of the Latter-day Saint Church. They need that in order to have a restoration, because without that, everything is just, it's just a fairy tale then. I would follow it up by saying that Mormonism shares some really important assumptions that inform its view of great apostasy. The first of which is a cynicism and a pessimism over, you might call, the pipeline of divine communication, uh, all the way from the inspiration of scripture to the transmission to the translation and interpretation. Uh, Mormonism treats that pipeline as essentially a breakdown of communication, and scripture is fatally and fundamentally incapable of, of uh, at least the, as it is in the Bible today, uh, it's incapable of giving us what we need for the fullness of eternal life. Another assumption is that Christ, and this is just sort of a background assumption that I don't think a lot of Latter-day Saints realize they even have, is, is it's this assumption that Christ uh, did not promise and did not start a kingdom uh, in the first century that uh, was promised to perpetuate. That there's no new covenant gathering enacted uh inaugurated promise of a people that would be effectively gathered and then protected up until the second coming. And there's this uh, massively important assumption about ritual priesthood authority, where uh, if Christ authorizes by his word, that is insufficient, that it, it, it has to be uh, ritually bequeathed, this authority through Mormon priesthood authority. And finally, there's a Latter-day Saint assumption of apostolic succession, uh, there's a, there's, and there's a particular Latter-day Saint variety of apostolic succession here, but there's right. this assumption that there is no apostolic foundation laid in scripture that suffices for the perpetuation of the church. In other words, uh, it's, it, it's not good enough that we have uh, access to the apostolic foundational teachings through scripture. We need to have living uh, prophets and apostles that continue on in the same fashion that the first did. Okay, so um, what would you think are some common like uh, examples or historical events that are used as a, to support the idea that the great apostasy happened? Like for example, um, I, I did ask this question on Twitter once and basically what I was asking was uh, if people uh, had evidence for the great apostasy, you know, and some of the examples that I was given was uh, the Council of Nicaea or something like that. So do you guys have any uh, examples as far as like, you know, things that you guys have heard uh, that people use uh, to support the idea of the great apostasy? We can start with you, Eric, uh, I'll go there. Okay. Yeah, the Council of Nicaea immediately comes to mind. Uh, Mormonism has long, at least as a culture, somewhat in its, you know, largely in its literature historically, uh, it shares a lot in common with the, uh, Da Vinci Code cynicism. Uh, hey, hey, Lydia, I'm, I'm on a um, live stream right now. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, it shares a sense of the Da Vinci Code cynicism of the uh, corruption of the of 
Constantine and the early church in deciding what was to be in scripture, what was to be the doctrine of God. And so they, they see that as almost like a peak or pinnacle expression of overturning what was a Latter-day Saint view of God or something closer to the Latter-day Saint view of God. They see an introduction of an impersonal deity and a taking out of important scriptures that were plain and precious that should have been in the canon. I think that's a completely mythological view of, of Nicaea, but uh, that, that's just how it's perceived by common Latter-day Saints. Okay, Eric, do you, uh, do you have anything? Yeah, so um, Talmadge goes in in his, in his book and um, he, he kind of favors a you know, late, late third century, fourth century, we put it around the Edict of Milan. Um, but that's not a very common view. But then I also hear a lot of the medieval era and the Reformation area from just laymen, um, Latter-day Saints. Um, but I would say that Nicaea is probably the most popular one. That is kind of interesting because we are going to be having uh, a stream about that, about the Council of Nicaea this coming Monday from Dr. Voice, and he's going to be addressing some of the myths uh, surrounding Nicaea, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to touch on any of that stuff. So uh, that's really interesting. Um, so um, I guess I can see I can see Robert Boylan in the chat saying this is just an attack on low hanging fruit with respect to false views of Nicaea. And he says that informed Latter-day Saints don't hold to that view of Nicaea. Um, I absolutely. <laughs> oh, well, it, it, it's it is true that there's a lot of informed Latter-day Saints who quickly rewind to something much earlier than Council of Nicaea. But when I'm on the street talking to Latter-day Saints, real flesh and blood Latter-day Saints that I'm trying to share the gospel with, the, 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 the typical Latter-day Saint that I'm trying to instill a confidence in scripture and a confidence in the basic continuity of Christianity uh, throughout history um, and the preservation of God's word, that's the stuff I have to deal with on the street. That there, there is a Mormonism on the street. There's a Mormonism on in the Sunday morning chapel, and then there's a Mormonism on the internet among you know LDS apologists who um, try to go after these issues. But they're they're just often very different streams of Mormonism. Right. Yeah. Hey, just to add on to that too, Aaron. He's he's 100 right. You know, the or Aaron's right. Excuse me. <laughs> that you talk to different Latter-day Saints face-to-face -face, and they're gonna give you different answers. They might not even give you an answer at all. I actually had the privilege um, because of God's grace, he allowed me to talk to two missionaries that are in my area and the great apostasy got brought up. And um, you know they gave me the scripture references for it, and I just said, so when did this happen? And they said, well, when the apostles died and the, you know, so that's just what they have to base. That's what they have been taught to say. But then there's other he, informed that go to Nicaea. There's others that believe that it was here. There's a, it, it's, it's not a pinpointed thing, but it had to have happened. And I see uh, Robert in there too, saying that it was a progressive thing. Well, that's not what some of your manuals say. In fact, the gospel pr principles actually says after the ascension of Jesus and the death of the apostles is when men did this to the gospel. So you have a pinpoint there, but there's just no historical evidence of that happening. So the burden of proof is on them on when this actually happened. And we don't, we just don't see that. Okay. Um, so let's continue with the questions that I have for you guys. Uh, so what role do the seer stones play in the restoration? Um, and, and we can start with you. Remember this, I, I, this was in the original list of questions and we were thinking earlier, is this, does this belong on the list? And I thought, yes, it does. And the reason <laughs> is it's a really good example of early Latter-day Saint thinking of being cynical about divine communication, uh, about this breakdown of communication between the inspiration of scripture, uh, transmission, translation and, and interpretation. The, the idea that that God uh, in his wisdom and power for some reason was unable to preserve his word and the, the essential meaning of his word uh, for the communication of the gospel through those that, through that pipeline of communication. 
through, those, through that process. So the, the idea of Smith with his head in a hat, looking through these magical seer stones, seeing, uh, say, a reformed Egyptian character, then replaced by an English uh, word or phrase, I think, um, the idea is that this is a more pure form of communication. It, it's, it's circumventing all the problematic things that, that uh, break down the communication. Um, so the idea is that something's coming direct. It's, it's, it's pure and we don't need uh, human translators. We don't need to worry about uh, the corruption of, of, the, of the manuscript traditions. Um, the idea is that this is coming straight from God. Now, uh, this quickly becomes problematic for modern Mormons because uh, Latter-day Saint scholars have realized that there's a lot of Protestant language and Protestant categories in scripture that, I mean, you, you kind of have to start asking yourself, was Smith a creative co-participant in the translation process? And so some Mormons take that position. It, it, it's Blake Osler even takes the position that Smith is creatively expanding upon the ancient, an ancient core uh, source. Um, but other Latter-day Saints want to maintain a more dictation style of Smith uh, communicating the, the Book of Mormon. So what they do so was some uh, Royal Skousen, a uh, modern LDS scholar on this topic, uh, what he, uh, as I understand it, argues is that there was an existing translation made of an early Book of Mormon text uh, in what's called early modern English. And this uh, existing uh, English translation uh, inspired of God was already produced. And that, and it was done during the era of where someone might, you know, be incorporating Protestant categories and Protestant uh, phrases. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a strange question. Why do we have these Protestant ideas and debates and categories in an ancient Native American text? And so this Royal Skousen idea is, well, maybe Maybe this is incorporated hundreds of years prior, and then Smith is dictating this. But I mean, the, the big idea is that um, Mormonism gravitates towards this idea of a great apostasy because it's fundamentally pessimistic and cynical about divine communication through the written word. Okay, Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I mean, he's he's got it right there. I would say that the seer stones or the Uranum and Thummim in the Bible were mostly used during the time of Moses and the Exodus until like the time of David. And then when we get into the prophetic time, um, they seem to not be around. Um, so I, I mean, I, you know, to me that to bring them back now, it just seems a little, you know, the, the apostles didn't need them. <laughs> Jesus didn't use them. So it's like, it, it, it just seems fishy to me. That's that's all I would say about that as an investigator looking in. Okay, uh, so Eric, um, we're gonna start uh, this question with you, and then we're gonna go to Aaron. And basically, what what I want to add what, when I ask this question is not um, maybe um, some clarification. This question is what is the gospel? But what is the gospel to an LDS person? And then you guys can sort of like maybe clarify our perspective on what the gospel means to us. Um, but first, I want to hear what is the gospel to an LDS person, and then uh, why this idea that it needed to be restored, and what exactly did we like lose along the way that Joseph Smith uh, brought back? So, Eric, whenever you right. So, the gospel in Mormonism is basically the teachings and the doctrines of the church, the commandments. It was the plan of salvation through the pre-existence and, and moving forward. Um, it's, it's obeying the church, paying a tithe, doing all these things. And the gospel is just that, you know, there's this big book called Mormon Doctrine uh, by Bruce McConkie. And you could read the definition and then, hey, there's an updated one by Millet. Um, and they're both saying not the same thing. Um, but just for instance, here, if we just want to go based on McConkie, who they would say, well, this this isn't doctrine right here. So but ju just in the first paragraph, he goes, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the plan of salvation. OK, so then you have to go in deep and deeper It embraces all the laws, principles, doctrines, rights, ordinances, acts, powers, authorities and key 
necessary to save and exalt men in the highest heaven hereafter. So it's not the same thing. And then they go on to define as, what, what does he say? Yeah, so it literally means good tidings from God or God's story. Um, that, that's how they're literally translating it. Um, the article of faith, the fourth one, says uh, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second repentance, third baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and fourth laying on the hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, those just sound like ordinances. I'm not saying that that's their definition, but you could ask a lay person in the Latter-day Saint church to say what's the gospel, and a lot of them will just spout that out, or you have to follow the teachings of the church. Um, so that's what I believed growing up, is you had to be a part of this church and you had to do the ordinances of the church. All right, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, gospel means good news. So if you were to ask a Latter-day Saint, what's the best thing about being Latter-day Saint? What's the, what's the best benefit of being Mormon? And I'd say at the top of the list for a lot of Latter-day Saints is that they get to be with their family forever. That's one of the big selling points. Uh, when they go to Latin America, when they do their missionary work, they are pushing very hard this idea that if they join the LDS church, uh, they can be sealed to their family members and be with them forever. And there's sometimes even a higher focus on that than there is on, say, having a relationship with God. So if I had to zoom out, though, and uh, just describe as briefly as I can sort of the, the good news of sort of the system of Mormonism as, as they see it. It's that we are of the same species as God and that God himself was once a man as we are now and he became exalted as a God. And there is one eternal round. There is a, there is a cycle of, of God's helping their spirit children become uh, mortals who then become resurrected, who then become gods. And so the good news is that we supposedly were the preexistence with Christ we were sent to earth to get a mortal body so that we could learn how to uh, keep the commandments and to endure suffering and to receive the benefits of, of the Godhead in, in this timeline. And then that someday we could be exalted. We could, we could die and then be resurrected and go to the highest level of heaven. And uh, with, a, with a wife that we're sealed to in a temple and uh, having followed all the commandments and the ordinances of the gospel, so to speak, uh, we would then be worthy to become exalted as gods someday who repeat the cycle, who, who, who uh, with our uh, exalted wife in heaven, we begat spirit babies and we populate worlds and we function as a god to the next generation. And uh, the, so Latter-day Saints sing in a hymn, uh, if, we, if you could tie to Kolob, that we don't know the generation of when the gods began to be. Uh, so there's this idea in Mormonism of the generations of the gods. So, it, I mean, it, it's it's the good news, so to speak, of of having this view, this sort of down-to-earth view of the gods, uh, and that we have a divine spark within us, that we're uh, we're sort of God, we're gods in embryo, is, is a phrase I've heard, uh, and, and that we can be with a family structure, a nuclear family structure someday. I'd say a, another big part of the, the good news of the Mormon gospel, as they see it, is they have modern day prophets and apostles. Uh, they don't have to worry about uh, the decision fatigue of which ch church to join. They know exactly which church to join. Um, they, they, uh, they have uh, you know, a, a, a really well oiled machine, if you will, I'll, I'll call it that. Uh, and then with the hierarchy, with a, with a, a first presidency and a, and a prophet president at the top. And that's very comforting to them that they have uh, these people who can make decisions and give guidance. And they see to, uh, the, the life of a Protestant is somebody who uh, has the in inadequacy of scripture, this, this breakdown uh, of communication through scripture, this, this, this fatally corrupted scripture. Um, we lack authority to baptize or practice any important ordinances. We lack temples. Uh, we lack eternal marriage. We lack a God that we can truly relate to. Um, we lack the hope of of becoming gods and ruling over our own world someday. Um, I, well, that's not brief, but I hope that, <laughs> that gives some meat to it. Yeah. Hey, ju just to add to Aaron, you're right. Like if you asked me what the gospel was, uh, 
when I was a Latter Day Saint, yeah, I would just say it's it's being part of the church. That would literally be my answer. Now that's probably the worst lay member <laughs> answer you could give. But then if you ask me, what are you looking forward to uh, when you get to heaven? It would be to be with my family, um, and that is that is exactly their hope, which is shocking because if you ask a a Christian. Um, on the street from any denomination, what are you waiting for when you get to, to heaven? And they're going to say to be with Jesus, you know, that is, that is just glorious. And then there's the hope <laughs> of a new Jerusalem, you know, the inheritance that awaits all believers in Christ, man. And it's just, Oh, that, that day is going to be so great. Now that's the gospel. The gospel in Christianity is that God created the world and we <laughs> humans, the creation, destroyed the creator's world, all right, through our sin. And then he brought hope. <laughs> and that hope is Jesus. Jesus then died on the cross for us all. And those who believe in him shall have eternal life, John 3, 16. Okay, then he was buried, raised, and then ascended. And he's sitting at the right hand right now. And he is just, he's, he's mediating for us. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't find that word. It was lost in my head, so I apologize. He's mediating for us, all right? In, in Hebrews, he's a great mediator. And he's coming back. And that's the joyous news that we have, that we live for as Christians, is that our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, second person in the Trinity, came he he voluntarily as paul says in philippians 2 while he was in the form of god he did not take his divinity as something to be exploited and he took on human flesh and he humbled himself he humbled himself so much even to death even death on a cross that is just that, that's joyous news right there and that if we partake every knee will bow that we will have eternal life with him and it's just great and I just, I just, I just pray any Latter Day Saint in there, like this is not an attack on you. I want you to be at the table with me in the New Jerusalem, and we're eating, we're sharing stories in front of our Savior, and we could break bread and just, and just, oh man, I just want you there. So I, I ask you, please repent, repent and turn away, and come and and feel the joy that we have, knowing that we will live in eternity with Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, whenever you're having conversations with an LDS member, uh, does, does this, um, you know, I, I believe you guys said that this is something that comes up. And um, I guess my question would be, like, how important is this subject as far as, like, um, with their theology and all those things? Um, and we can start with you, um, Eric, and then we'll go to Aaron. If you want to just give like a yeah, uh, so, so can you say this question again? You said so. The, does this conversation ever come up when we speak with like, like does this the 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 um the great apostasy does it ever come up and um, how important is the subject to them as far as like whenever you have conversations with them? Right, I think it depends on the nature of the conversation um, and what is being discussed. It's not. Um, I I think it's probably going to be more on the um, the non-Latter-day Saints to kind of ask a good question about it. Um, but maybe with missionaries, it's going to be a lot, a lot easier, but with lay, with lay people on the street, like with street evangelism, like, like Aaron uh, does often, um, he could probably attest to that a lot more. But in my experience here in South Carolina and North Carolina, um, it doesn't come up unless I ask a question like, well, why was there a need for a restoration or why do we need the Book of Mormon? Um, and those are good, valid questions to ask as uh, as evangelicals, um, as Protestants or even Catholics or uh, Eastern Orthodox. You know, those are good questions to ask, like, why do we need this? Um, and then it will slide in to that conversation. OK, Aaron. Yeah, it, it seems to come up maybe when we're addressing some scripture. So, I mean, part of evangelism is often opening up, opening up the Bible and looking at scripture together. And 
when there's a scripture that a Latter-day Saint sees doesn't fit with the Latter-day Saint worldview, there's a kind of fallback or, or a defense mechanism or a plausible deniability coping mechanism of saying, aha, well, we, you know, we believe the Bible insofar as it is translated correctly. And, and you kind of flesh that out a bit. And it's like, well, the idea is it wasn't translated or in, in the, they're really thinking transmitted correctly. Um, and then you kind of unpeel that and then, oh, it's, it's the great apostasy. Um, and so it, it comes up through other topics. But to be honest, I think a lot of Latter-day Saints today are embarrassed or, or shy about the topic uh, it, it, because it's very bold and overt and it separates itself from the rest of Christianity. Uh, it, it, it basically says all the other churches are wrong and all their creeds are an abomination and the professors are corrupt. So uh, that's not something a modern Latter-day Saint is, is, is uh, something that they'd like to say publicly or even in polite company. So it is something that Christians, I think, have to bring up. Um, it it kind of it has a ripple effect or a cascade effect on how Latter Day Saints think. Um, so that comes up with thinking about this might be helpful for evangelicals out there who are talking with Latter Day Saints who might be transitioning out of Mormonism or just curious about you know other Protestant faiths. Um, so there's these questions that come up about you know do you, are your are your um, what denomination are you part of? Um, like th sometimes Latter-day Saints are thinking imaginatively, what would it be like to leave the, the LDS church? Where would I even go? Um, all these churches are false. This is just a, a mess of denominations. Um, and so there's a kind of gentle coaching that evangelicals go through to talk about um, how evangelicals think about the authority of scripture, the reliability of scripture, the legitimacy of paying our pastors, that's a huge issue. They think that is a, an evidence of, of churches that are downstream from the great apostasy. Up until 1990, even in their temple ceremony, they were depicting Protestant ministers as hirelings of Satan. In their own secret private temple ceremonies, they were mocking Protestant ministers. That's up until very recently, um, it's about 30, 31 years ago. Um, but yeah, it, it, it comes up when it's stimulated by other issues. Okay, um, that's really interesting. Um, so do you think that there are biblical narratives that support the, this view, the view of, um, you know, that there was a great apostasy or perhaps like that may contradict it? Because, you know, like when we believe something, like, you know, we as Christians, um, like if we believe in the Trinity, we believe in, you know, like salvation and things like that, like how do we get saved and all those things. Like um, we go to scripture for that. And so uh, when it comes to the great apostasy, do you guys think that there may be some text that perhaps point towards uh, perhaps the Bible talking about this eventually happening? Or do you think that the Bible totally contradicts this idea of the great apostasy? Um, what do you guys think? Uh, we'll start with you, Eric, and then we'll go to Aaron. Yeah, so the only way the Bible talks about a great apostasy, great apostasy is if you're reading that into the context, um, because there's several other passages that would claim that it, it, Christ's church is not going to be forsaken, all right? Um, we have passages like um, Matthew, let, let me pull it up real quick because I had it, I'm sorry, um, Matthew 16, 8, that's what it was, you know, this is where um, Peter confesses Jesus as the son of God, you know, the Christ, the Messiah. Um, and he's like, you are Peter, the rock in which I will build my church, you know, so he's, and the gates of hell will not prevail over it. Right. Um, so for them to say that there's a great apostasy is almost like calling Jesus a liar that the gates of hell did prevail over it because what would Satan want most? Well, his church to not prevail. All right. And then we also got the great commission. All right. The great commission, he is commissioning the, apostles to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? So for them to claim that, that means that the apostles failed at their job, that they didn't make disciples to go make disciples. That's how discipleship works. We know this just even today in church that when I make a disciple, I then disciple him to go make disciples, and it's a, it's a domino effect. So for them to claim that is just saying that the apostles failed, that they didn't listen. But the two main texts, now there's there's a few, but the two most popular, I think, 
um, because they're in the manuals, uh, in the gospel principles, is Amos 8, 11 and 13, and 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Um, and that's what the LDS will give you. I know that's what the missionaries give me. Um, and if Aaron wants to talk a little bit more on what he thinks. Yeah, on the... On the net, on the negative side here, just passages that Latter-day Saints use to support a great apostasy. It's important to keep in mind that as a rule of thumb, the texts that Latter-day Saints use to support it from the New Testament are usually in a context where the author is encouraging and even guaranteeing and ensuring his audience uh, that they should and will endure through the dark time being warned about. So if there's a coming apostasy or a coming dark season, uh, the, the author of scripture is telling them so that they can get through it. Um, or this is referring to something that culminates in the second coming. It's not something that's fixed by the restoration of the church or the replanting of the kingdom. It's something that uh, comes to some uh, uh, great violent uh, epic conclusion with the, the return of Christ, um, where uh, the church and the kingdom of God is preserved through all of this tribulation, all of this apostasy, all of this darkness, all this rebellion. Also, none of the passages that Latter-day Saints use fulfill the needed conditions to satisfy uh, a universal great apostasy. So that, that's really important here is that uh, we're not talking just about general apostasy here. We're talking about the fundamental idea that the kingdom of God and the church was was completely taken away from the earth, um, where the, the the kingdom of God on earth literally ceased to exist, and none of the passages that Latter Day Saints use uh, support that. So some yeah some classic ones would be Amos eight and I think Second Thessalonians two. Um, Amos eight is just I mean I I love it when Latter Day Saints bring up proof texts like this because it's just so easy to look at the context in Amos eight for example. You have, I think the book is largely going after the Northern Kingdom for their apostasy and keeping the high places. And there was uh, the, the, uh, the imminent uh, exile, Babylonian exile to happen here, the, the judgment that was to come. I and, think it was the Assyrian. The, the Assyrian. Oh, the Assyrian yes. The, yeah. Babylonians, Southern Kingdom, Assyrians, Northern yeah, Kingdom. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good correction. Well, this is resolved. Um, with two other texts, um, Acts, or sorry, uh, the next chapter, Amos chapter nine, and then which it, it, Amos is quoted in Acts chapter 15. Uh, the the, the uh, conclusion of this uh, dark period spoken of by Amos eight is uh, that the gospel essentially would go out to the Gentiles and that Christ would gather his people. And so th this isn't something that's solved by the coming of Joseph Smith. This is something that's solved by the coming of Jesus Christ. And this is how the apostles saw it in Acts 15. Uh, similar to just real briefly in 2 Thessalonians 2, again, this is uh, final events culminating in the return of Christ himself. Now, as for a positive case, uh, Eric already started this. Um, we have the whole promise of the new covenant in the Bible that someday God would set up a kingdom and gather a people securely and effectively and perpetually with a guarantee of, of uh, a, prevent, a preventing of definitive apostasy of individuals that are in this group. Um, they're, they're kept, they're preserved. Jesus uses language like uh, sheep in the hands of the father, preserved and protected. No one can snatch them away. For me, uh, one of the most astounding set of passages in the Bible relevant to the great apostasy narrative is Matthew chapter 13, where you have what you might call kingdom growth parables. And in these parables, Jesus, first he sets up uh, the framework for how the kingdom grows. It grows through the spread of the word of God and through the reception of the word of God. And it bears fruit in individuals when someone receives the word of God into their heart and it's not snatched away um, and it's preserved. Now, the Matthew 13 chapter goes on to talk about uh, different parables that where Jesus describes the planting, the establishment of the kingdom, and then the perpetuity of the perpetual growth of the kingdom. Uh, the, the wheat and the tares, for example, coexist, they perpetuate, and uh, 
there's no uh, premature uprooting or weeding uh, until the end of the age, until the harvest, until the, the final judgment. Um, and then you have the mustard seed that is start, it starts small, but it, it gradually grows until full maturity. It's doubly fascinating to me because Joseph Smith seemingly understood the import of these passages. And so what he did is he reinterpreted these passages. There's a book by Charles Harrell called This is My Doctrine, The Development of Mormon uh, Theology, where he addresses Joseph Smith's reinterpretation of these passages to not refer to the initial establishment of the kingdom by Jesus in the first century, but rather to the reestablishment of the kingdom through Joseph Smith. So it, it, what ends up being Jesus-centered for Joseph ends up being very Joseph-centered. Uh, but we have also very clear promises that uh, heaven and earth would pass away, but the words of Christ would not pass away. Uh, the kingdom would, the, the church would not be prevailed against. Um, you know, there's, there's language where, you know, Jesus is a groom to his bride. He won't let his bride die. Uh, he protects, he preserves, he cherishes his, his bride. He's the good shepherd. He won't let his flock be destroyed. Um, he won't let his kingdom, like I said, be uh, replanted or won't need to be up. It won't be uprooted. And at the very end of Matthew, when Jesus gives the great commission, he says, I will, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Uh, in, Ma in John chapter 15, Jesus says to the disciples, I chose you and appointed you that you should go bear fruit. You should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Uh, so yeah. we, we all, the, 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 the burden of proof is entirely on uh, the, the LDS people to show us that Jesus set up a kingdom that ha basically was destroyed and had to be replanted through Joseph Smith because we have these incredible promises from Jesus to preserve and to protect his flock. Yeah, Aaron, just, you know, you made a, you made a great point that I think a lot of people uh, or a lot of Latter-day Saints have a misconception is you guys are, are claiming that there is a great global apostasy. That, that doesn't mean that people didn't fall away from the church. That doesn't mean that, um, I mean, look, just look at Second Thessalonians, your proof text. You know, before that, Paul is telling the, Thessal the Thessalonians, don't let anybody deceive you about the, there was people that thought that the second coming came and that they left. <laughs> All right. And he's like, no, no, here's the signs of the second coming. All right. So there will be a great rebellion and then the man of lawless, lawlessness will come. And that's how you know. Well, to have a great apostasy, then you need to name the man of lawlessness. All right. We need that name. Um, secondly, even in that verse, it says um, in verse three, don't let anybody deceive you. It just if that if that's their proof text, then we need to look at, OK, well, are you being deceived then? Don't let anybody come and deceive you that you're missing out because that's a clear thing that, look, people in the church who were taught by Paul, someone came in and said, no, you guys missed it. Sorry. And they're like, oh, no, Paul. And then Paul's like, no, guys, chill, chill. Here, here's how you know. Um, and yeah, so that, that's just a great point too, that at the end of the Great Commission, the part that I stopped, he's like, I will be, Jesus literally said, I will be with you. <laughs> And it's just, man, that, that's just, is glorious. Um, and I see that in the chat. That there's a misconception then. Well, then what happened here? Like, that doesn't mean that there, you're talking about a global apostasy. It doesn't mean that there aren't people um, trying to change the doctrine. In fact, let's talk about Nicaea. If you want to talk about Nicaea, that's exactly what Nicaea was doing. It was stopping Arianism. All right, Arianism was trying to take away the deity of Christ <laughs> and um, the church apostolic fathers, the church fathers were like, uh, no, this is the deity of Christ. And then that was Nicaea. It wasn't how they got the canon. And my good friend and scholar, uh, Dr. Stephen Boyce, is going to be talking about that. And I just I challenge you guys to watch that um, because he will be very, very resourced. So I challenge you guys to watch that. And I think it's next Monday, if I'm not mistaken, on Explain. Short little plug. It, 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 yeah, it will be here on Explained Apologetics at 9 p.m. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the uh, if Nicaea 
basically got to choose the gospels. Like if we had the gospel of Thomas and stuff like that, and they were like, yeah, we don't like that one. We just got to get it out of the way. And we're going to pick the other ones. We're going to pick John because John sounds cooler at the beginning. Um, <laughs> but no. Um, so I have one final question for you guys. And this one, you guys can basically just, uh, uh, you know, it, if, if you want to keep it short, that's totally fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and while you guys answer this question, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go ahead and, and look at the chat, see if we look for some questions, and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A, and then we'll just do some final thoughts after that if you guys are okay with it. So um, my last question for you guys, and we'll start with you, Aaron, uh, will be um, basically, is there anything else you want to share uh, with us, like relevant to the conversation and resources or um, you know, maybe books or anything like that um, that may help people understand uh, what this is all about and how do we deal with it. So, Aaron, uh, let me start with you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, if you're a Latter-day Saint and you want a gentle introduction to Christianity, uh, you might consider a book by Lynn Wilder, uh, and you might consider looking on YouTube for Micah Wilder and Adams Road and their music and their ministry. Um, I work with Mormonism Research Ministry, which was at mrm.org. Um, we we greatly love you, and uh, you know I just want to encourage you that there have been times in history where Christians have looked around and they've said, "Oh, nuts! Like, where's the church? Like, uh, where where are the genuine Christians? Um, who who's left?" Uh, well, that this has happened in in biblical history before. Uh, Romans 11 verse 3 quotes Elijah who says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars and I alone, alone am, am left and they seek my life. Paul says, but what is God's reply to him? Quote, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So note two things there in Romans 11. There's always a remnant chosen by grace. And if it's based on grace, it can't be based on works. Uh, this is something that gives God the glory. Um, secondly, I just would want to glory in the person of Jesus by way of contrast here. Um, you know, on, on the negative side, Mormonism says that Jesus essentially uh, failed at establishing a kingdom that was perpetual in the first century. Uh, he planted a church that was ultimately destroyed. He gave a word that was insufficient to authorize. Mormonism has given us um, a final dispensation head that isn't Jesus. I'm not sure if people know that, but the final dispensation head and the final dispensation in Mormonism is headed by Joseph Smith. Uh, he's, the, he's the head of the last and final greatest dispensation. Um, Mormonism uh, has not given us any guarantees that its scripture won't be rescinded or retrofitted. Its Book of Commandments was retrofitted. Lectures on Faith was rescinded, taken out of the Mormon canon. Uh, Mormonism has given us temples built with human hands. Uh, it's given us a temple veil put back up. Uh, it's given us high priests that are not final. It's I, And if, if you'll consider this, please, Mormonism is refusing to obey the apostolic commands for how to do New Testament church life and leadership. Look at first. Timothy and Titus and how they, they do church leadership. And modern day prophets and apostles in Mormonism, they say they have impressions, but they can neither confirm nor deny that they have literally seen the risen Christ. And so I would just say to glory in Christ by way of contrast here, Jesus got it right the first time. His apostles that he ordained, that he chose for himself in the first century, they were protected from teaching heresy. Mormons can't say that about their own prophets, um, especially informed Mormons. They find plenty of examples where Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles have taught gross falsehood, even from the conference pulpit, later denounced as heresy by subsequent leaders. Whereas in the Bible, someone like Samuel, a prophet, it says the Bible says that none of his words fell to the ground as the Lord was raising him up as a prophet. Well, Jesus he chose apostles for himself and, and he protected them from teaching heresy and they actually saw the risen Christ. They met the criteria of Acts, of Acts chapter one. Jesus laid a durable foundation 
a durable foundation through his apostles with the written words and teachings of his apostles. He's given us scripture that is living and active and preserved. He's given us a kingdom that can't be shaken or uprooted. He's given us a word that is sufficient to authorize what it commands. Christ has torn the veil of the temple in two. It says in the Bible that when Christ was on the cross, the veil was torn in half. And Christ has built a temple in heaven not built with human hands, and someday that will temp that temple will descend to earth. And he has preserved his church through mass apostasy, through mass persecution, through suffering and confusion, much worse than we've ever seen in America. Uh, the church has been preserved in far worse circumstances. Um, if Christ can grow his kingdom through a mustard seed, if he can he, if he can encourage Elijah with a remnant chosen by grace and preserved, surely he can preserve his church with his word and the apostolic foundation of the teachings of the apostles for 2000 years after Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant has established and inaugurated this secure covenant, this promise to gather a people for himself and to preserve them and keep them in the father's hand as a good shepherd protecting his sheep. What a savior, what a savior. Joseph Smith is boring compared to this. He is not impressive. Um, when Joseph Smith, in one of his final sermons, boasted of having had uh, disciples that did not run away from him in contrast to Jesus, he's essentially, if you can search this up on the web, Jesus, uh, Joseph Smith boasted of having done a better job than Jesus at keeping the church together. This is especially offensive to Christians who cherish the promises and the, the finality of the work of Jesus Christ in gathering a people and providing for them uh, an atonement. Anyway, I'd go on till two in the morning about this. I love this stuff so much. Jesus is enough. He's sufficient. He is able. He's capable. He's omnipotent. He is all wise to keep a church together, preserved and protected. All right. And with that, Eric, do you have anything to add? Uh, from from what Aaron just said, man, that was that was rock solid, man. But all glory to God, and thank you for your ministry, Aaron. Um, I'm, I'm not even going to add what I wanted to um, because that was good. And uh, yeah, Christ is sufficient. And I just pray and I just hope that all you Latter-day Saints watching in the chat rooms, please just look at the doctrines of what your church is saying, what Joseph Smith said about God and Jesus and then compare it without any presuppositions. I mean, it's you can't you can't even mistake it. It's completely wrong, and you have no biblical proof. And it's not about sola scriptura because I see comments about sola scriptura. It's not even about that. It's about what did the apostles? All right, so you don't even have to affirm a sola scriptura to know what the apostles are saying, since you're claiming that the apostles built the church and then men dictated it. It's right there, what the apostles are saying. It's right there. And I just I just hope that you guys repent and, and come to know and love the Jesus that I have experienced, that is in my life, who I talk to and I pray to, and he he guides me. All right. And I and I live my life for him. I Luke 9 23, I pick up my cross and follow him daily. And I just pray that for you guys. And uh, man, Aaron, I just appreciate that little uh, that that closing that closing section because I could not, I could definitely not have beaten that one. So thanks. All right. So um, I do have a super chat uh, here with a question. Uh, this is from Don Fulman, and he's asking: There are many denominations of Christianity. Is that is the LDS is the LDS Church completely wrong? about the doctrine, or is it a cult if they're wrong? Uh, I think I might have butchered that a little bit, but yeah, is it a cult if they're wrong? Right, so you're gonna find, I think I'm the only person that has openly said that I don't think Mormonism is a cult. It started off as a cult. If we wanna define what a cult is, um, I think Gomez states that a cult is a, a branch claim to be Christian, but then doesn't teach 
Orthodox Christianity. Okay. But so I, I agree that in the beginning it was a cult. I think now it's a world religion. They have their own doctrines, their own teachings, all that stuff. Um, just like any world religion and it's grown and it's going around the world to make it a world religion. Um, so I would say yes and no to that question, but I think I'm the only one that's actually written said that I don't personally, I would never call them a cult today. I think it's a world religion. Um, and because of that, we need to avoid um, calling them cult members. Um, I thought it was offensive growing up. Um, and I know my family members and friends would find it offensive. And that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to offend. We're here to be, to share the grace and truth and love and walk in wisdom towards outsiders. So I just, that's just my little spiel to Christians. Um, Aaron, you could disagree. Um, and, and I would be happy for that. All right, Aaron. So, uh, if one believes that Mormonism is a cult, I would ask, what's the definition and right. I wonder if we might get more headway by describing how Mormonism s satisfies or doesn't satisfy that particular definition. So there's what you might call a theological cult where it is parasitical on the existing, you know, the infrastructure and meaning and scripture of Christianity is sort of latching onto that. It's not genuinely new or genuinely separate. It's just, it's dependent on, um, it feeds off of, uh, sort of the, the nominal fringes of, of Christianity. Um, so you might be able to argue for that aspect of it being a cult. It, there, there is one other aspect that I think people have used the C word more for in its, um, what, there's a New York Times article that was written by Noah Feldman, who I think during the Mitt Romney candidacy was addressing uh, this notion that sometimes Latter-day Saints won't say publicly uh, what they might teach privately. Um, what, what they teach to their own people in the gospel principles isn't necessarily something they would explicate to a journalist um, or, you know, what, what a missionary would sort of, to a, a, an investigator might be very carefully crafting in his words, might unfold, you know, months later to, to be something that the investigator would have appreciated an earlier detailed explanation on. So it, it, you might call it soft secrecy. It, it, it comes from, some people argue it comes from a historic uh, vein or tradition of Mormonism having to protect itself. So it was under a lot of persecution and uh, it was trying to keep its polygamy secret for a season. And it was trying to sort of function in a bigger world without having to take so much heat. And so there was a kind of rhetoric that developed within the Mormon culture where Mormons were not necessarily overtly taught to do this, but it just be kind of became normalized to avoid clarity, to, to use uh, language that could be, you know, mistaken for something else. Um, so to, that, it, where it, that kind of has a soft echo today, where if you ask Latter-day Saints, um, do you believe in multiple gods or do you believe that God has always been God? Um, you might get an answer at first that sounds extremely Protestant or classical Christian. And you'll, you'll sort of dig under that. And um, 10 minutes later, you find out, oh my goodness, they believe in billions of gods and they believe the Godhead is three gods and they don't believe that Heavenly Father was always God. And yet they gave me the exact opposite impression just minutes before um, and so there's a very difficult dynamic there on the street with Latter-day Saints where evangelicals, we don't want to be quick to demonize people or, you know, come down too harshly and condemn people or, you know, assume the worst motives or intentions when that kind of things happen, kind of thing, kind of, kind of thing happens. So what evangelicals have to do is I think is just practice a lot of patience and say, you know what, I, I think there's just a cultural um, bent here not to be as honest as they could be. Um, at some point, it does become lying. It does become deception. Uh, it does become demonic. Um, so I, I, I would say that this, the language of, of scripture for such a group as the Latter-day Saint religion is much stronger than the C word of cult. We have uh, uh, of the ant it's, it's uh, of Satan, of the Antichrist, uh, it's of darkness, it's of the prince of the power of the air. Um, cult has a more sociological bent to it to, or, or uh, assumption or connotation to it. Whereas I think Christians are all the more concerned about the spiritual component of it, the theological component of it. Um, 
So it all matters, but I, I would just try to get down to the meaning. When it comes to multiple denominations, that's I think that might have been the first half of the question. That's kind of the heart of it. Um, is the LDS church right about the fact that there's so many denominations and is that a problem? Well, um, you, you kind of have to understand that for born again Christians or evangelical Christians, the, the most pressing question for us is not which church should I join? The more important question for us is which Jesus should I believe in? Uh, who Jesus is matters a thousand times more than which local church or denomination you should belong to. And uh, arguably, biblically, um, it's, it's you know, which denomination you end up with or which local congregation you end up with, um, it might not be a make it or break it kind of thing. It, for Christians, um, finding a reasonably Bible-believing, theologically solid, faithful, gospel-loving church uh, is a good start. You know, find yourself a church that's doctrinally uh, faithful and has a people that love the Lord. But, you know, every local church is going to have its issues. And that's not the end of the world for us. Um, even We might even go to a church where the pastors or the elders have a position on some second tier issue that we don't agree with. That's not it's, it's OK for us, because what matters to Christians is a shared core of fundamental belief in the basics of who God is and what the gospel is, according to the finished work of Jesus Christ done on the cross and the simplicity of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. That, that is what brings Christians together in unity. And then we try to shake out the details. If I define a denomination as a variation of thought, then Mormonism itself has 17 million different denominations, one for each person. Mormonism radically has internal massive disagreements around core doctrines uh, that have not yet been settled. Uh, there are camps of thought, streams of thought within the mainstream of the LDS Salt Lake City based sect on really important issues that Latter-day Saints often aren't even aware of. Um, there are massively radically different denominations of thought, even within Mormonism. Robert Boylan, the LDS apologist who's in the chat stream right now, he represents a certain vein or strain of thought within Mormonism. And he takes positions that other Latter-day Saint scholars and apologists disagree with. Um, and so if you want to, you know, hold to a, a definition of denomination as being a variation of thought, then that would be a different denomination. Right. Hey, yeah, that, that that's a good point, too. Um, I guess I didn't answer the denomination thing, but um, Mormonism has their own uh, denominations. There, here's a great resource. It's called Scattering of the Saints, the Schisms Within Mormonism. And, and you're right, Aaron, is that... Um, they couldn't even get right on who could be the prophet afterwards. Some have followed the son of Joseph Smith. Some follow Brigham Young. Some follow, um, uh, oh boy, what's his name? The Britonites. You know, th there's so many sects today um, that they in themselves have <laughs> have de denominations. So um, are we willing to call them, those guys, cults? And also, let me, that, that was my point. Now, when we go back to the cult uh, titling. Um, you're right. We do need to define what a cult is. Um, and I think modern day texts, um, context of what the word cult means. I just don't see that in Mormonism today. I saw it back when Joseph Smith was around, you know, you know, we have cults today that practice polygamy. Well, they had that back then. Um, so that's why I would not ever hold to them being a cult as of today for, anybody um, asking that. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna uh, do a simple question and then uh, we, uh, I'm gonna look for more. We can do maybe like a, like three more or something like that uh, on top of this one. Uh, but this one is from Scott and Scott is a good friend. Um, I had him on the channel before, I had a conversation between um, Eric and him and, and Scott. And so he wants to know if the church never strayed why aren't you a Catholic? Well, Scott, we need to define what you mean by Catholic because I am Catholic. If, if you mean by the great tradition, um, by the by the Catholic Orthodox Church, yes. But if you mean Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic was not the original church. So if that's what you mean, there's reasons why I'm not. And uh, it's because of the sacraments and things like that, because they're 
that doesn't mean that everybody practiced the same thing that Rome did. So that doesn't prove an apostasy. A reformation doesn't necessitate an apo a great falling away. It just means that people in the church took advantage of some things. And then someone who believed differently, which means that he had the gospel, changed it and reformed and made Protestantism. Okay. So I think you need to define what you mean by Catholic. And by the word strayed, uh, we do believe the church strayed. Uh, we just don't think it definitively apostatized. Somebody asked earlier in the chat, um, when did the church need to start reforming? And I would say day one, uh, day one of the church's existence, it had to be about the process of continually reforming itself back to conformity with the word of God. The, you know, the it's interesting thing about uh, cat being Catholic um, is that uh, that often means being Roman Catholic, and that's a very narrow definition of Catholic. That that's basically privileging historically the Bishop of Rome, whereas the original idea of being Catholic had more to do with a warm and affectionate and a broad sense of collegiality between all the churches of Christianity that were sharing through the handed down apostolic tradition, otherwise known as scripture, uh, you know, be or best communicated through scripture, uh, best expressed through scripture. Um, uh, they, were, they were unified around the common message and the, the meaning of uh, what the, the apostles taught. So to be Catholic meant you were in conformity with um, what the broad collegiality of Christian churches were teaching and believing. So when the uh, reformers, when the when the Protestant reformers were trying to retrieve or go back to or uh, reform to the meaning of scriptures, they were also consulting the teachings of the patristics and the early church fathers. Uh, to be a Protestant reformer both means to go back to the original intent of scripture and to do systematics based on what scripture teaches, and it means to be in consultation with what this broad Catholicity, this collegiality, this rich historic Christian tradition of right. teaching taught. Right. And, and to just to interrupt for a second, there's, there's a comment here by uh, Kelvy who says, this is why the Trinity is so important. And we see that <laughs> through, that's what Nicaea was doing was, was defending the deity of Christ. And it, that never left. That never left the church. Even Catholics believe in the Trinity, and even in the Re Reformation, they didn't refer. He didn't reform Luther and the Ref and the reformers. Never reformed anything about the doctrine of God or the deity of Christ. It, it just it wasn't in there. Um, so again, you're right, Aaron. We just need to define what you mean by Catholic. If you're talking about Roman Catholicism then they they practice some things that Protestants don't. Um, the church can not, stray and yeah. remain the church. It exactly, because they got the core, the core doctrine of what Jesus taught about himself. Let's keep that. Let's, he taught this about himself, that he is the great I am. He is the alpha and the omega, pointing them all the way back to Genesis 1-1. <laughs> all right? So it's... It's, that, that's just a, a, a silly argument, I think. Um, I had a question because I have to go down and look at this uh, comment. It disappeared uh, because of the timing and all, all that stuff. But uh, the question was, I think, from Scott. And he was asking, what about the, the women uh, in Revelation in the wilderness? Uh, like, you know, I, I guess um, uh, when she's running away or something um he gave him a specific um scripture for that so if scott if you want to repost it that, that would be great because i don't remember what it was but i thought it was an interesting question um and uh, that was disappeared once i clicked on the other one um so yeah yeah uh, can i take that one eric Good. Yeah. yeah, by all means, because I mean, I think, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, what so I, I, I need the passage first. Yeah, this is, uh, this is, what is this, Revelation 12? I forget the exact chapter. Um, 
remind me of that. But anyway, DNC 86 um, recasts this. Uh, let's see here. No, 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 that's not right. It's, that's different. Uh, I, I retract that statement. <laughs> Um, Revelation 12, verse 7. Okay, give me a second here. I'm looking up a source here. Okay, so I would look at Robert, sorry, Charles Harrell's book, This is My Doctrine, The Development of Mormon Theology. And he deals with um, how Latter-day Saints construed a lot of these early passages and I would make the case that not even early Latter-day Saints construed Revelation chapter 12 to mean that there was a great and total apostasy. Rather, this was uh, understood in a manner that had consistency with the idea of the church being preserved. Um, so I found it here. So I, I'm just, I don't have, I don't know enough to speak off the cuff on this issue. Yeah, the, the, give me um, the scripture is uh, Revelations 12, 1, 6. Yes, I do know that, but I, I wish I had a minute or two to look up my sources on, let's see here. Latter-day Saints have since, of the time of Joseph Smith, have continued to view this passage as referring to the loss of the church. In one LDS explication of this passage, and he quotes Joseph Fielding Smith, most non-LDS scholars would agree that J John was speaking of the intense persecution of the church in his own time. They don't see a universal apostasy or Latter-day Saint restoration in John's imagery. Indeed, most scholars view the woman's fleeing into the wilderness to mean that the church went underground or dispersed from the area to escape Roman persecution. It should be noted that after she fled into the wilderness, a dragon who had been cast out under the earth pursued her with a flood of water, but the earth helped the woman and thus protected the church. The, the scene John paints is not unlike the portrait that portrayed elsewhere in the New Testament, that the church would continue to suffer Satan-led persecution, but would remain protected on the earth and ultimately triumph over evil. So who did I just quote? I quoted BYU professor Charles Harrell. Again, this is in uh, volume one. If you get the Kindle version, it's volume one of, this is my doctrine, the development of Mormon theology. Um, this passage can easily be and plausibly, most plausibly be construed in the framework of the church being protected on earth, not removed from earth. And even a BYU professor that I just quoted agrees. Okay. So um, I see a lot of comments and not, not really actual questions directed to you guys. Um, but here's one from Robert. Uh, he's basically asking the question, what did they teach? When he's talking about like the, the church, I imagine he says he says Ignat Ignatius and his uh, contemporaries first recorded instance of Catholicos, Catholicos, I think uh, in the Greek, used held the doctrines that Aaron and Eric will reject, and these are central issues, not minor ones. Uh, I guess, and I don't want to. The the thought of this question is like, okay, so you're talking about like these individuals throughout church history, they thought certain things that you will reject nowadays. Uh, how does that, you know, how does yeah, that? I mean, I mean, if, if the logic here is that I have to agree with everything Ignatius taught, then I, I don't follow the logic. Um, right. And in fact, I would say if, if uh, Robert Boylan uh, became uh, doctrinally in alignment with Ignatius, I would, I think both Eric and I would be like, Oh, that's great. Um, please dig in more. Um, it, the, the further he becomes like the early church fathers uh, in their in the original intent of what they said, um, what these what these early church fathers are teaching is nowhere near Mormon doctrine. Uh, this idea of a, a regression of gods and the ancestry of the gods um, that God and, and man are, uh, were always of the same species um, that we could become rightfully worshipped someday by our own creatures governing our own worlds um, that God the Father was perhaps a sinful mortal yet to become a God or that sinners can someday demand worship from their own spirit children and call themselves holy, holy, holy. No, 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 no. Uh, Ignatius is, um, if, if uh, Protestant evangelicalism is over here and Mormonism is over here, um, Ign Ign Ignatius is, 
is right about here. <laughs> so I mean, it, it, there, it's it's pretty futile for Mormon scholars to try to trump up uh, the distinctives of Mormon theology by appealing to the early church fathers. Usually, very selective. Uh, very, yeah, not holistic. Okay, uh, Eric, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, not on that question, but yeah, I'm 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 with Robert. Or I'm I'm with Aaron that uh, if if Robert's trying to claim that I could disagree with the church fathers and I could disagree with the reformers I could disagree with Aaron I could disagree with a whole bunch of people um, and that doesn't mean that there's an apostasy you know he's he's also saying stuff about baptismal regeneration that we would say a heresy one don't put words in my mouth when have you ever heard me say that two. I'm okay with someone holding that. I don't hold to that, but I do know that I believe that you are saved by faith through <clears throat> grace alone. And that the text says, repent and be baptized. They need that faith to repent first. Now they, that might not be Aaron's uh, soteriology, but that's mine. And that doesn't, that doesn't conflict with us. Okay. Cause we're still brothers in Christ. We're brothers in Jesus. We understand that Jesus is God in the flesh, and he died for our sins. Then he was buried, and then he raised and ascended, and then he's coming back. We hold to that. He was never a created being. He was never the half-brother of Lucifer, okay? He was never um, the first literal firstborn. No, he was eternally generated from the Father, and then they spirated the, the Holy Spirit. Now, see, some people don't, like Eastern Orthodox, don't hold to philoquy, okay? That's the, I probably said it wrong, too, but that doesn't mean that that's wrong, okay? It's just a different thing that we hold to. And just to think, continue, yeah. Eric's thought, just to continue this, um, the, the I remember, okay, good story here. I was at an interfaith roundtable discussion and I uh, was at a table with a guy named Andrew. And I remember speaking to the issue of baptismal regeneration uh, Mormonism will use this language of baptism for the remission of sins. And so I was making the point that the only proper baptism that Mormonism thinks is valid is, is baptism done by proper priesthood authority within the Mormon church. So the, the logic here is, um, and, and I've let plenty of Latter-day Saints have agreed to this logic, is there is no remission of sins outside the LDS church unless you are baptized under the authority of the LDS church, the priesthood authority, um, there is no remission of sins because they say baptism for the remission of sins. And they, they use that preposition. They construe it to, to mean th uh, there's no true remission of sins until the event of proper baptism. So I'm, I'm just talking about this at an interfaith roundtable and contrasting this with the Christian position. And this Mormon uh, named Andrew pipes up and he goes, well, actually, actually I believe remission of sins precedes baptism. And I'm like, really? What? That Does that not contradict what your church teaches and say gospel principles and other sources? And he goes, well, look at DNC section 20. And he showed me verse 37, DNC 20 verse 37, where there was a kind of, uh, if I remember correctly, there's a kind of uh, pre-qualification list for someone to be baptized. There's, you know, something like a baptismal interview. Um, you, you're figuring out if a person is the right uh, candidate for baptism and the uh, qualification, the pre-qualification for being bapt baptized, according to my friend who's reading DNC 2037, is that you have to have a remission of sins. So a remission of sins is prior to baptism, even according to some verses in the distinctive LDS canon. So, that, I mean, that's if, if you want to disagree with your own canon, uh, go for it. Um, but there are some Latter-day Saints who reject the notion of baptismal uh, regeneration insofar as that means you can't yet have something like the remission of sins. And there's there I've even met Latter-day Saints who believe that you can receive the gift of the Spirit in uh, unordinary ways or abnormal ways. Um, the, Mormonism is so diverse in its theology at, a, at an individual level. Um, but yeah, I, you know, not every, not every false teaching is a, is a functional heresy. Yeah. Not, not, not every stupid idea sends people to hell. I mean, God is so good. He is so gracious. And I believe there's going to be plenty of people in heaven who had very simple childlike faith. And when I, you know, uh, when I look for 
fruits of true salvation. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for someone's ability to articulate um, robust Christian doctrine in all the best of ways. I'm, it's really more of a sum total assessment of does this person have a childlike faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his finished work? Have they received the forgiveness of sins? And, or or are they of the spirit of the age and you know, of the Antichrist? And are they shooting in a different direction with their doctrine and their behavior and the, the lack of affection for God's people? Right. Yeah. Good, good point. You know, I, I don't, I don't know why he would consider that we would consider something different as a heresy. Maybe, maybe some other Christians have said it and that's what you're holding on to, but I'm never going to say that someone holds something completely different that's that is still an orthodox. I mean, just because I don't hold to it doesn't mean that it's heresy. Now, if you go ahead and say that Jesus is the half brother of Lucifer or that he's a created being and hold to modern day Arianism that has actually been condemned as a heresy, then yeah, I'm definitely going to say that. Or if you hold to Sabalianism, uh, then yeah, I'm going to say that is a heresy. But Okay, uh, so I'm going to take this as the last question, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and close it up. Um, so this one is from Scott. He said, why in Revelation 14, 14 does an angel come proclaiming the gospel before the second coming of the gospel exists in its fullness? Um, yeah, proclaiming the gospel before the second coming of the gospel exists in its fullness. I could look at it and do something later, but I don't have an off the cuff answer. Same here. I would have to concede. We, I, I'm not going to just take the text and just do a quick exegete of it. Cause that would not be fair to, to God's word. All right. Uh, with that, I think that, um, Actually, I don't I see something. Any... If you don't okay, mind. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I got another Charles Harrell quote. Um, I, I love using Charles Harrell. He wrote a book, like I said, this, uh, this is my doctrine, uh, the development of Mormon theology. And he he addresses common Latter-day Saint passages used to support the total and great apostasy. And he does make reference to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Um, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this is what BYU professor Charles Harl says, the burden of the angel's message message, which sets the theme for the remainder of the chapter, is not one of salvation or restoration, but of impending doom. It is a particular aspect of the everlasting gospel that is proclaimed by the angel, one composed of fearful judgment rather than Christian hope. The angel, furthermore, is not represented as visiting the earth, but as proclaiming his message in mid-heaven. His message is not heard by a select few, but by all the inhabitants of the earth. That sounds reasonable. Amen. And with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and basically uh, close it up. But before that, I will ask you guys if you guys have any final thoughts. And we're going to start with you, um, Aaron, and then we'll hand it over to Eric. Yeah. So one of the fruitful challenges I've given in the past is to take one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and to read it for a year over and over and over again. Uh, w this was very fruitful in my life going through the Gospel of John and later through the Gospel of Matthew. Um, what better way to get to know the person of Jesus than to study his words and his works? If you really believe that you are a disciple of Jesus, or if you want to become a disciple of Jesus, if you want to know the person of Jesus and obey him, and believe him and trust his words, then get to know one of the four gospels really well. So one of the problems with, you know, modern American reading is that we, you know, we have a, we have a pretty poor attention span. So what my challenge would be to both my evangelical and my Mormon neighbors here would be to take a, a book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and then take your existing religious framework, your questions, your positions, and then to subject them to the light of scrutiny under one of the four gospels. Uh, you can look up the LUMO project, L-U-M-O, the LUMO project, and they have videos of the four gospels word for word, and they're done excellently. I, I would say it's even better than the chosen because it's just straight scripture. 
Um, so take one of those Lumo Project videos over the four gospels and put it on repeat for your commute. And, and you don't have to look at it while you're driving, but listen to it. Um, make a habit of just consuming that. And then, you know, what I, what I did when I went through John is I just started realizing that John had its own themes. And there's certain questions that uh, are stimulated by reading something like the Gospel of John. And you go back and you reread the same book and those same questions are answered by the book itself. Um, I promise you, if you do this, Mormonism is just going to seem less and less uh, consistent with scripture. It's, it's, um, I, I, you know, I remember when I was in the latter part of high school, um, I do remember holding to a very, uh, false idea. Um, uh, well, at least I, I would have been brought up at times hearing it. It, it was, uh, what we might call easy believism. It's the idea that a person could be justified by faith and yet not be sanctified inevitably, that they could live like the devil and enjoy full assurance of salvation, even though they weren't bearing fruits of genuine repentance and faith. And I remember reading the book of 1 John, and the book of 1 John just, just it was such a hard and difficult and emotionally difficult book to read, because I had to do, you know, how, how do you fit this idea over here with 1 John, which so clearly teaches against it, and you're, it, it stresses you out well, let the Bible stress you out. Let the Bible put do a stress test on your doctrines and your notions of who Jesus is and use uh, the words of, you know, I'll, I'll end on this. Jesus said things like, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And he says in John chapter six, um, my, my word is full of the spirit and of life. And he says in John chapter five, if you, anyone who, uh, hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he says in John 17, uh, when, when praying to the father, father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And we learn about abiding in his word, trusting in his word. Uh, this is the means by which a disciple of Jesus abides in the vine and bears good fruit. If you want to know the true Jesus, zero in on his word, trust it like a little child, be humble and uh, let yourself be stressed out by scripture such that you get to a point where you just surrender yourself to what scripture actually says and you give up the fight against what God has spoken. All right, Eric. Man, it's so hard to go after Aaron. He just he just knocks all the points and he, uh, he uses the same thing I do is reading the gospel. I love the gospel of John. Um, just reading the gospel of John like it's the first time you've ever read it. Um, and just, and just looking at who Jesus claims he is, then who Thomas says he is. Okay. Who, who the disciples carry their name. They carried the gospel to their death. We have more reason to believe that the, the 12 apostles, ex excluding John died as martyrs. They took it to the grave, not recanting. And they went to North Africa. They went, Philip baptized an Ethiopian eunuch. He went to Ethiopia. He shared the gospel. We have Thomas going to India. We have, we have Bartholomew heading towards India. We have all these disciples going everywhere and they were making disciples. So to claim a great apostasy is to say that they failed to call Jesus a liar. And I know that you would never claim that Jesus was a liar because you claim that he's your Lord and Savior, but you have a different understanding. And I'm telling you that Jesus does not exist. We're talking about a different Jesus. I just want you to know that Jesus is the son of God. He is the only begotten. And what he said about himself is completely true. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through him. That he is the alpha and the omega and that he's coming back. And I seriously just want to, I, I pray for you guys every single day to experience what I've experienced. Listen, I did the same thing you guys did. I read the Book of Mormon and I prayed and I got this burning in the bosom and I wanted everything and I wanted my family, but there was something missing. And that was the Holy Spirit. The burning of the bosom is not the Holy Spirit because it's false. It, you want that to be true. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will reveal who 
he is, who Jesus is in the text. And I just pray that you guys just repent and, and come, come to know the true Jesus like I have and like Aaron has and like Santi and how many other Christians in the chat have been, has been trying to show you. And, uh, and if you ever need to talk, if you're worried about things, listen, I've been there. I know. Please reach out. And I'd, I'd love to just pray with you, answer questions, whatever I can, in just a respectful way. And that's all I got. All right. And with that, uh, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Uh, every single one of you guys are watching this, uh, as well as Eric and Aaron. It was a pleasure to hear what you guys had to say about this topic. And uh, if you guys found this conversation to be profitable and you learned something, um, don't forget to share um, the conversation with other people around. There's a lot of Christians that don't know anything about this kind of stuff, so it will be great for them to get to hear from Eric and Aaron uh, to hear this information. And uh, thank you guys so much. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't or like the video. And we'll see you guys next time in Finding Truth. And once again, thank you all.